Hello and welcome again to the Theories of Everything program. I'm David Tower. Viewers, this is the second program in our big picture series, Theories of Self, in which we examine the notions relating to self and identity and personality and many of the processes that go with this, the processes of forming memories, the subconscious, the conscious self, um, the creation of emotions and belief systems and in fact all the phenomena that go towards making us what we are. Now in that first program we saw that because of the latest techniques in magnetic resonance imaging or brain scanning there's come a new realization which goes directly against many of the old beliefs, beliefs that were not only held by the average person, but held by philosophers as well. Philosophers, as I mentioned in the previous program, have had a fairly easy ride. Meant much of their work has involved introspection and logic relating to understanding the nature of how things occur, the nature of perception, the nature of how the mind works in relation to the brain and so forth. But it hasn't had the backing until recently of the physical sciences the cognitive sciences in this case. And uh, in summary, basically those studies have shown that most of the decisions we make, the decisions we think we make at the conscious level, are in fact made up to half a second earlier at the subconscious level. The results are then passed to our consciousness um, and we believe that we have made that as a conscious decision rather than the decision being made prior to that at that uh, subconscious or unconscious level. When we walk down the street, for example, most of our actions are made at the subconscious level. How we walk, where we look, we're constantly impacted by uh, phenomena, by perceptions, by sights and sounds. We constantly glance in windows, we glance at other people, we respond to sounds and other stimuli. And when we think we make a conscious decision, for example, because we're hungry, we decide to go and eat, we look at a particular restaurant, at that point in time, um, we think we make a conscious decision as to whether to go in or not. In fact, probably we don't, because perhaps if we've been to that restaurant before, we immediately visualise the scenario that occurred at that previous time. Perhaps we find that... Uh, Perhaps we found that it wasn't a very pleasant experience. The service wasn't very good, for example, the food wasn't really cooked the way we wanted it. So we combine that memory and all the information surrounding it. We recreate, in other words, the feelings that we had when we went and, and uh, went into that restaurant previously. And we make a subconscious decision that we probably won't go in there again, not at this particular time anyway. That decision, or the results, the outcomes of that decision, is then passed to our conscious level, and we believe we make that decision not to go into the restaurant. But it's based on all our previous experience and our knowledge. And in fact, again, imaging shows that we've made that decision earlier than we come to it consciously. And of course, we also mentioned the fact that when we get into the deeper analytical processes, the processes of science, initially, as well as arts, um, much of the creativity is done at that subconscious level, occurs at the subconscious level. Whether it's Archimedes having a sudden inspiration in the bath and the nature of hydrodynamics, or whether it was Einstein having a flash early, very early in his career of riding a light beam. Whatever it was, it was made at the subconscious level and we noted that ma many mathematicians are created at that level also prior to doing the further analytical work and prior to um, implementing the scientific method in science. But initially, that initial creativity in, is, occurs at the subconscious level. So this uh, creates, of course, um, a lot of soul searching, and, and, but also opens up opportunities to understand the brain better, to understand all the processes that go on and which we call the mind and to further our knowledge of our own place 
in the world in relation to others and in the universe at large. So what we have in individuals life then is more a stream of activities, perceptions, reactions to those perceptions, interpretation of information through the reality of our, of our brain. And we put that stream of consciousness, if you like, into a perspective, into a time perspective. It's a string of memories, around those memories, which are dynamic, uh, are created our actions, and we keep track of all those things in, a, in continuity, in a continuous form, and that creates our self. So viewers, memory is the key to creating and maintaining the notion of self. It's the thing that holds all the snapshots that occur, all the events, all the activities, all the interactions that occur in our life and makes a smooth stream of consciousness of them. It creates the illusion. So it has to be extremely powerful, extremely efficient because again it operates largely at that subconscious level. It has to be able to be invoked Chains of events have to be able to be invoked whenever there's a need for a decision or a threat presents itself, an action is required. So the, whether this occurs at the subconscious or at the conscious feedback level, creating the, the mechanism to keep track of what's happened. So memory has to be extraordinarily efficient and it has to be able to be evoked in fact, very simply, very quickly by by a, a sensory input, whether it's vision or sound, a sound of a, a song, for example, um, or a smell was particularly potent. Now, in his, uh, in the famous book, Remembrance of Things Past by Marcel Proust, which was one of the longest books, in fact, in, the, in English literature, 15 uh, su uh, subsections, uh, a million words, almost, it was about the time and place in which Proust lived, the middle end of the 19th century in France. It was about all the things that happened at the political level, at the social level, all the gossip that went on in his world, all the interactions that went on between the individuals that he knew. And, uh, and at the beginning of the book, this whole history of his life is evoked by one simple sensory input, a smell, the smell in fact of a madeleine cake which has a very rich aromatic smell, it's, a, it's like a, it's a little cookie, a little cookie cake for example I think they're still around and his aunt, when he was a child, his aunt used to give him one of these uh, whenever he visited her which was usually daily, she'd dip it first in her cup of tea and then give it to him and it had a, a lovely rich aroma and years later a long time after she died, when he was well into his adulthood, he smelt that aroma again and it evoked all those memories of childhood and everything came flooding back and that created the basis for the book. Now, it's only recently that a real understanding of that process has occurred at the molecular level. Um, the Pavlov reaction of a dog that uh, salivates in response to a particular smell was well understood and if that smell is associated with the ringing of a bell eventually the ringing of the bell can produce the salivation. Uh, that type of response was, has been understood at the surface level if you like for a long time, 50 odd years. However at the molecular level the understanding has only come fairly recently and the understanding of memory as a whole. Memory is a very complex thing. It has evolved through for all life over hundreds of millions of years. And the first um, split in understanding memory, if you like, the first understanding of how it evolved is that it occurs in short-term form and long-term form. We have a short-term memory and a long-term memory that's reasonably well understood. We know that if we're trying to remember a couple of telephone numbers we can only remember a maximum of say nine or ten numbers unless we have a lot of practice at it. And short-term memory uh, can be split into several components too. At the phonological level that's at the level where we where we can sort of talk to ourselves and resonate the words in our mind. 
the visual, visual spatial level in which we can manipulate images, and then the central executive section, and this occurs in the in the, uh, the frontal cortex, that manages short-term memory and uh, the the visual aspects, uh, the word aspect, the mental word aspects, etc., and brings it all together. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, that short-term memory is badly impaired. The long-term memory is relatively unimpaired. Long-term memory is created from the short-term memory. It's usually, well, in fact, it, it, sleep is required to do that transfer across. It's archived. It may take some time to produce that archive from short-term memory, but the short-term memories are archived usually during sleep to that long-term memory. The long-term memory may also be split into two parts, the, a declarative section, uh, one that keeps track of all the words and places and objects and concepts that we, that we understand, um, and the procedural long-term memory, which is developed when we develop particular skills, riding a bike, playing a sport, uh, playing a musical instrument, even walking and running. Those long-term memories are required to recreate our past. The short-term memory is to grab hold of the sensory input that comes in quickly. Now even um, declarative memory has been split into two categories, um, the semantic memory, and you can have, and there is, uh, which is basically again, objects, places, uh, and language mainly. Mainly language and reading and understanding of words uh, retrieval of information, whereas the other side of declarative memory is episodic, which is all the uh, events and places in our personal history, the events that have occurred. So we have a semantic memory which is concerned with language and which is badly affected in people who have semantic dementia or dementia in general. Uh, their long-term memory is affected as opposed to Alzheimer's. The short-term memory is not too bad, up to a couple of days. Now, at the molecular level, again, as I mentioned, it's only this has only been under recently understood, and the Proust's association of a smell, for example, with the events of his early life, uh, that association has also only re fairly recently been understood at the molecular level. The mammal mammal brains, in particular human brains, consist of as a huge number of neurons, a huge number of brain cells, uh, up to a trillion in fact. And the way that memories are created are in the form of networks of connections between those cells. There aren't specialised, there are very few specialised cells in the brain, one for memory, one for uh, uh, causing motions, etc., motor cortex, neurons, etc. That doesn't happen. The, mo the neurons in the brain are very similar. What creates the specific memories are the connections, the strength of those connections, the number of those connections in complex networks throughout the brain, in, well, in specific uh, areas but across the brain in general. Short-term memory is mainly contained in the so-called hippocampus, a group of cells in the centre of the brain, lower centre. And the long-term memories in the cortex, the newer part of the brain that developed in later humans on the surface. Um, but the connections are what creates the memories. And what happens in a typical cell is that when it's stimulated by a particular sensory input, whatever, um, there is what's called a resting potential. There is a difference in electrical charge across the membrane of the cell. And when the uh, cell is stimulated from another cell, a presynaptic cell if you like, the, uh, there's a flood of sodium ions allowed through channels in the surface of the cell, which creates the, not the resting potential, but the action potential. There's a wave of uh, electrical activity goes down the axon of the cell 
forming the action potential. And again, that automatically releases to the next cell at the end of its axon a series as a chain of neurotransmitters. In the case of memory, the transmitter, the neurotransmitter is, gl is glutamate. Glutamate is released and it passes across to the synapse of the next cell, the postsynaptic cell, and links to two, um, two sensory receptors on the surface of that cell, known as AMPA and NMDA. Uh, AMPA opens up and allows that flow of, um, in response to the neurotransmitter glutamate, and allows a flood of sodium atoms again to come into that cell and activate it again, and so it goes. Now the, uh, the response is to some extent though geared by the reaction at the NMDA receptor. That will only open, that's normally blocked by a magnesium ion, and will only open if that particular synapse has been pre-sensitized, if you like, if there has been a previous lowering of the potential at that receptor and the magnesium ion has moved out of the way. If that's the case, in other words, if there has been another stimulus associated with the original stimulus, which could have been, again, uh, activities, but the other stimulus may have been a sight, a sound, a bell, or in, in Proust's case, the smell of the cake. If that's previously been sensitized, it will allow a flood of calcium ions to come into the cell as well, and calcium ions will have an impact on the sodium ions coming through the other receptor and in fact make them more sensitive, more powerful, if you like. So by, have, by linking those two sensory inputs together, uh, that creates the learning process in the cell. It learns to associate those two inputs, whatever those So viewers, if this learning process continues, in which there's a weaker signal which creates greater sensitivity in the stronger signal, for example, a, a noise, a sight, a sound, a smell, um, within the same neuron, then you have what's called long-term potentiation. A weak signal can trigger an influx of calcium ions, which increases the sensitivity or increases the availability of the sodium ions and strengthens that stronger signal. But there's an association between the two, and this occurs all the time in our lives. Uh, there's also a desensitization process occurring as well, quite often. For example, we can get adapted to traffic noise. We can get adapted to the feeling of clothes on our skin. But the sensitization process occurs regularly also. If we hear a sudden sound, and at the same time someone puts their hand on our shoulder, for example, we become quite sensitized to that because that sound may have been a gunshot or whatever. And if that continues, every time someone puts a hand on our shoulder, we may jump. So this process of association, learning, sensitization, and often sometimes habituation or desensitization is occurring all the time within cells and creates this process called long-term potentiation. And in this process, new proteins are actually generated, uh, new synapses are created, and uh, synapses, there were the links between them and the neurotransmitters between them, such as glutamate, are strengthened. So the, cell, the, um, the uh, learning process is extremely dynamic. Our brain and our memory is extremely dynamic. It wasn't known for, for the last hundred years, up to about five years ago, that this, how dynamic the human brain and memory was. Um, there's another form of association also with animals in, and ourselves, in fact, in terms of place cells. We become sensitised to a particular environment. This was critical uh, for animals because of the search for food and for us. But even modern day taxi drivers develop increase, increasing uh, sensitivity in certain place cells in the hippocampus. Uh, when they get to know a particular area and when they arrive in that area again. Now, about five years ago, uh, a, a variety of different experiments sh showed that not only could memories be strengthened 
um, but they could be changed. Long-term memories, if they were brought back uh, into cognizance, into the cognitive consciousness of the person, and then a new set of stimuli applied could change that long-term older memory. In other words, it was more fluid, it was more plastic, it was more available for change again. But if it stayed stored in that original long-term archive, and then new stimuli were applied again in the same way, then there would be no change to it. Only if it was retrieved, and then a new stimulus applied. But also, so-called plasticity of the brain occurs in many other ways as well. Whole areas of the brain can be co-opted. For example, if in, a stro if the case of, in the case of a stroke, where a certain loss of mobility uh, occurs, certain areas of the brain that, uh, that have died through lack of oxygen because of the stroke, the functions that occurred in those areas will be searched for new areas to occur. And if there's a loss of vision, if there's a loss of feeling, whatever it is, new areas will be co-opted to replace the older areas. Not only that, it's been shown also uh, in recent, in the last five years, that neurogenesis, so-called growth of new neurons, can occur. Now this again was unknown up for the last hundred years. It was assumed you could continuously lose neurons, but it was not known that you could regrow neurons. And this has brought about a major rethink in the way uh, diseases are now diseases of the brain and uh, neuroscientists uh, continue to understand the brain it's brought about a new approach to treatment of major neuro diseases such as Parkinson's, Huntington's um, the uh, common uh, brain cancer glioma for example in, with the proliferation of cells and so forth. So the new approaches focus on neurogenesis, the growth of new of neurons, and, uh, but this is not straightforward. Previously, treatment of these diseases focused on increasing the amount of neurotransmitter, which because if cells may have died related to those transmitters, um, there was a loss. For example, in Parkinson's, there's a loss of the neurotransmitter dopamine. So, a substitute for L-DOPA was added and can alleviate some of the symptoms. Again, there were transplants of fetal tissue as well, and these worked to a certain extent, and progress and also the, and the growth of axons in spinal cord injuries. But the big breakthrough is in neurogenesis, understanding how new, new cells are generated um, in parts of the brain, or the multipotent stem cells, for example, uh, which are generated in the ventricles of the brain, generates the precursors of neurons and glia in the hippocampus and in so-called the uh, olfactory bulbs as well, the centres for smell, which may account for the sensitivity of smell. Because learning processes occur in the hippocampus and apparently in those olfactory areas, and therefore that's the major site for understanding the growth of new neurons or seeing the growth of new neurons. So this has been a major breakthrough but understanding how those neurons eventually uh, mature into full-blown neurons, brain cells or glia, which are the cells that keep those neurons together, uh, is still not known and how they, how they can be migrated to the most appropriate area in the brain to fight a particular disease at a particular, in a particular spot. So the signalling processes have to be able to be better understood and the neurotrophic, so-called neurotrophic uh, factors that guide those neurons towards a specific spot uh, also are in the early stages of understanding and development. But some uh, neurotrophic factors, for example ampokines, the class called ampokines, are already being tested and show great promise in treating these diseases. Diseases again such as uh, Alzheimer's that are caused by loss of cells in the hippocampus for various reasons. And uh, so where there's been a loss of cells if you can migrate the new cells to that area successfully and again it's a tricky process. 
then there is the option of making massive breakthroughs in these very, very severe uh, diseases that affect a large, a surprisingly large effect, uh, proportion of the population. But that again leads to the brave new world of cognitive enhancers, new ways of enhancing memory cognitive capacity. But then again we already do that with coffee. I'm David Tao and you've been watching the Theories of Everything program again. I'll look forward to seeing you again next week.